Kia ora koutou, everyone. Welcome to our session and thank you for joining us today. My name is Anjum Rahman and I'm here basically um, as the moderator for this panel and my background uh, around misinformation is that I'm involved in the Christchurch Call Advisory Network as well as the Global Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism. And we'll just do some introductions of the panel. So Tina. Uh, kia ora mai tato. Um, my name is Tina Ngata and I am a uh, Ngāti Pro woman and I work for my people of Ngāti Pro um, in environmental and Indigenous rights issues. Cool. Emmy. Hi, uh, I'm Emmy Bevancy. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I work, I founded the Social Media Analysis Toolkit, um, Rebellious Data, and I'm also a Mozilla Open Web Fellow. Thanks. David? Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Um, kia ora and welcome everyone. I'm David Shanks. I am the Chief Censor for Aotearoa and it's great to be here. Thank you. Kia ora and M. Hi everyone. My name is M. My pronouns are they, them. I'm a philosopher who specializes in conspiracy theories, fake news, and disinformation. Currently a teaching fellow at the University of Waikato, but off to China next year to become an associate professor. Awesome. Um, so our topic today is focused around... Uh, Sarah? Hi, oh, Jim. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I mean, I could be forgotten, it's fine. Oh, um, I don't know how I did um, that. Okay, like, now that I feel completely embarrassed, um, my name is Sarah Hendrika Bickerton. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Auckland, particularly the Public Policy Institute, and I have a particular interest in um, uh, tech policy and researching social behaviour online. Okay, great. First moderation fail. Look out for a few more guys, <laughs> but hopefully it'll be great. Okay, so our panel today, we're focusing on uh, misinformation and disinformation, and if you read our little blurb, we want to focus on the links to harm, um, to extremism, uh, and we want to look at more global issues rather than just individual issues, though we'll do that as well, and look at some solutions. So you should be able to type into the chat, which we hope um, that you will do. And the first topic that we want to cover from the panellists is around um, a definition of what is mis- or disinformation, and um, the panellists will be giving their brief definitions around that, but we'd also like you guys to throw into the chat your thoughts around what those things mean for you. Um, and again, I will start with Tina. Sure. So um, my understanding, and I, and I wouldn't call myself the expert, especially in this forum, but my understanding around misinformation is information that isn't um, quite true, is not, is not verified as fact, and it's being shared on um, sometimes unwittingly and then that the disinformation part which is important I think to distinguish the two the disinformation part has a level of intent behind it so there's a, a direct intention to um, uh, manipulate or utilize that misinformation um, towards a particular end or agenda. Cool Emmy? Yeah I'll just I'll just add to what Tina said. Misinformation is generally just some degree of information that's some degree false uh, that's being shared naively or ignorantly. Um, and disinformation is generally part of coordinated or semi-coordinated campaigns. Um, but I, I think what I'll add is that there are different scales of how true or, or false something is like within this field, and that can be really important. But there's also different scales of harm, like Bigfoot is not as threatening of a conspiracy as like COVID or genocide denial. Um, a bunch of people in the US don't believe that Australia and New Zealand exist. So you could talk to those flat earthers about that if you want. Um, but um, the other thing I would just mention really quickly is that there's a pretty substantial difference between uh, 
top down or bottom up spread of mis and disinformation like top down we have like intelligence agencies running fake media outlets and uh different corporations or whatever and then bottom up we have like networks of people that maybe are true believers or whatever awesome um david yes look i'd agree with um what tina and emmy have said in terms of the distinction between uh misinformation and disinformation that's largely a matter of intent um i'll throw another term in there just to mix things up is malinformation which is um another category again where you're conveying something that has truth in it that's uh that has some element of truth but you're taking that truth completely out of context or presenting it in a way um that uh that is determined to be malicious so you're actually aiming to deceive someone by using something that has a kernel of fact in it um i think i'd also say in the context of the internet which of course is the context that all of this is largely premised on being at net hui all of these categories they're important to understand but they morph and meld and merge into one another um, and context is everything. So I think that's really useful to bear in mind in terms of um, these sorts of term terminologies. Awesome. We've got um, a couple of things in the Slack channel coming up. So um, Anthea said, misinformation or disinformation to me is information shared as verified fact, usually with the goal of influencing the audience. Um, and oh, Sarah, this time I won't forget you. It's your turn. No. Um, so I, I mean, I'll tell Toko everybody what's been said previously, but the major point I wanted to bring up was was uh, um, while intent matters for differentiating between misinformation and disinformation in terms of um, understanding how to combat this kind of work. Um, the important thing to understand is that um, intent often has no impact on the impact of either the misinformation or the disinformation. So while you may be sharing something that is misinformation um, or by, with the best of intentions, it may have the same or even worse impact than um, uh, uh, mis, uh, sorry, disinformation or malinformation. So it's understanding the way in which we're using intent here. Um, intent isn't a magical wand that makes everything that you did okay. It still can have a really negative um, point um, about this kind of uh, understanding of the way in which information can um, impact others. Awesome. So we've had a question in the chat, which Em, you may or may not want to address, but other ones you can address after Em, and that is, can disinformation become misinformation when it's shared, shared further down the line then, originally shared with intention to deceive and then shared by someone who believes it to be true? So I'll hand over to you, Em. So at the risk of sounding like we're a mutual backpatting association, I'm going to agree with all of my colleagues here about the various definitions of dismiss and mal information. I think it is interesting to talk about disinformation from the perspective that we worry about disinformation when it comes from powerful agents. And so it's useful to actually note the origin of the term disinformation, which uh, cropped up in the 1930s when certain people accused the Soviet government of being engaged in a massive conspiracy to, uh, to produce fake verdicts in a series of trials in Moscow. And the Soviet Union's response to these accusations was, no, that is disinformatia disinformation, where the term comes from. And it turns out the people who were spreading disinformation were the Soviets, because there was a massive conspiracy being run by Stalin at the time to render false verdicts in a trial. So the origin of the term is actually kind of amusing, because it was disinformation agents who coined the term and then put it into use. Cool. Thank you so much for that. And I'll just um, share with you guys a couple of comments in the chat. I'm interested in talking a bit more about truth. I'm concerned that truth value uh, might be unclear or contextual. Um, sorry. 
and that complication should be explored. Positionality matters when defining truth, I suspect. And I think we will be talking more about truth as well um, later in some of the topics. Um, just want to give panellists any thoughts that they wanted to add in terms of the question that came in earlier. Um, or if you guys think that it has been covered, that's also good. No? All right. Okay, let's um, move on to the next um, thing that we want to address is why is all of this stuff problematic and what effect does it have on communities, individuals and society? So again, we'll start with Tina. Um, so I, I generally operate through looking at the Te Ao Māori impacts, how it's impacting upon my communities here, the Ngāti Pūrau communities in Mairohe, um, and then I look at also Indigenous communities as well. Um, for what one of the things that I can see coming through really strongly, particularly now that things have heightened in an electoral context, is that groups who are traditionally marginalised and misrepresented in media and feel manipulated by the government or done wrong by the government and, and in general have good reason to not trust science, media and government are generally very susceptible to picking up misinformation um, and not necessarily scrutinising it as much as, as much as we could or would. And so all of those things apply to Māori communities because we have a long history of being misrepresented for political ends by the media um, and that still happens today and we have a long history of experience with science as well that has been um, not well you know it's, it's not done well by us and then we have a long history of course of um, political oppression and so um, we, we're very ripe for the picking for those who would who would like to um, share disinformation or when we come across misinformation as well. That's also tipped over into um, into potentially violent spaces for us as well. So um, issues of vandalism and um, personal threats, uh, physical threats a lot of those things have, have wound up um, occurring as well. So, yeah, that's what we see happening in our communities, particularly around issues to do with 1080, um, 5G, and, and um, yeah, other issues as well. Cool. Thank you, Tina. Um, if we could go to, sorry, Emmy. Um, hi. So... Uh, this, I guess the best thing for me to share a little bit about this is I've been, uh, I've had lots of large scale conspiracies started about me, um, on the scale of like tens of thousands of people. Um, and as a result of that have been the recipient of like massive semi-coordinated harassment campaigns, including doxing and all kinds of weird, scary stuff. And the reason that that happened was because I wrote a very nerdy scholarly article about uh, conspiracy media, like sort of alternative media is really important, but there are some kind of sketchy alternative media outlets with weird funding and weird agendas. And I wrote a little niche thing about this. And then within a week, I was like the subject of this massive thing. And what's really interesting about it is the methods that they used which is like something that we would call splintering, which is basically, you know, an initial kind of central hub would write something and then a bunch of outlets would uh, splinter it. They would basically write a five word different version of that article and then all cite each other so that they seem really official and then uh, start blasting it on social media and different forums. And so by the time it got to me, it was already like a tidal wave and I was creating network graphs of it and stuff. And so it got me really interested in this, but it was also really scary. Um, people started coming to my co-authors uh, school, talking to uh, our workplaces and stuff like that. Um, so that's just like the personal level, not the community. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, David. Okay, so 
why really is disinformation a problem? Um, and uh, I think it doesn't, you don't have to look far to actually see the evidence um, and issues that disinformation is creating um, uh, right across the board. Um, a, a really current one that many people will understand and relate to is the, the, the pandemic situation or the infodemic that's associated with that. And right at the beginning um, of the year, um, early on when there was um, initial signs of um, the COVID-19 pandemic hitting globally, um, I was saying to pretty much anyone who would listen, I think we might have a problem here with disinformation and conspiracy theories. I, I, I just have that feeling. Now, I had no way of knowing at that time that um, eventually we were going to be dealing with situations where, for example, there were conspiracy theories suggesting that um, COVID-19, for example, was ma a manufactured virus engineered or was essentially a, um, a fake creation of governments and a conspiracy, a cabal of billionaires, and that ultimately there would be um, issues pointed, uh, directed at, say, the 5G network, which would in turn um, result in us looking at Facebook videos with people um, filming themselves attacking cell phone towers. Cell phone towers that weren't 5G, by the way, but um, essentially attacking cell phone towers apparently connected to the theory that 5G transmissions would be necessary to activate the nanobots that were going to be injected into people's bloodstreams with the vaccine. So no one could predict that happening, but um, I, it was certainly foreseeable that there would be an infodemic, that there would be heightened anxiety and concern, and that that would roll into the real world in ways that could be unpredictable and could be dangerous. Um, so I think there's, there's absolutely evidence that um, heightened levels of disinformation and conspiracy theories can spill into the real world in terms of crime, attacks on infrastructure, um, or, or even violence. I, I would say I'm not um, advocating for censorship necessarily as the answer to these issues. People would say, well, the chief censor is talking on this panel. Um, he must be seeing this as a key response here. No, I think ultimately at, at, the, at the end, you are dealing with potential extremis, extremism and violence, and that's where my authority can be activated. So it's a complex issue. Thanks. Uh, Sarah, I can go to you. Your mute is on, Sarah. God, rookie era, God. Um, Okay, so uh, I was thinking about this in the context of uh, um, what we've seen in the past couple of years with the rise of what is known colloquially as TERFs or um, transphobes um, on the internet. And the, uh, the, the, I see this as part of the way in which New Zealand operates as an intersection point between uh, global and local narratives of um, uh, particularly around politics in this particular case. And the way in which uh, this wasn't uh, a local issue in, in New Zealand, but yet the global narratives and the way in which uh, it's been taken, particularly New Zealand being used as a battleground location around uh, negotiations of this, which misinformation was spread um, via a small astro, ironically, astroturfing um, group in New Zealand um, resulted in uh, as like a slowdown in legislative changes in New Zealand, um, and we've seen heightened uh, attention and violence towards uh, trans people, non-binary people, um, uh, both discursively and um, uh, via um, uh, um, it's like actual physical violence. Um, and I wanted to use this as a particular example about the way in which um, uh, mal misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation particularly operates in terms of uh, along lines of power and inequality. That the the way in which uh, you and your access to uh, your power 
um, uh, makes you more vulnerable to the way in which uh, misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation can function. And so understanding misinformation, uh, disinformation without uh, a power analysis has really negative effects. I thought I'd compensate for the fact that David was over. <laughs> All good. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and Kim. So one of the things that's kind of important for a discussion about disinformation and misinformation is that you also need to talk about the kind of society in which these claims spread. If you've got a badly informed society, it's much easier for disinformation to be put into it and then to be spread unwittingly by people who are then misinformed by that disinformation. And the example I want to bring to the table is one that I've had a little bit of argy-bargy online with, which is the so-called Celtic New Zealand thesis. The claims that actually Europeans got here first, Maori wiped them out, and then the whole treaty settlement process is a kind of farce being led by iwi and government to hide the real history of this place. And one of the reasons why these disinformation claims that the Europeans got here first get into discourse is it turns out most New Zealanders have no idea of the history of the colonization of this place. The initial colonization by Ma Maori and the subsequent colonization of the place as a kind of clothed endeavor from the UK and other Euro European powers. So people assume Pakeha arrived here, there, were, there, there was a land war, we signed a treaty and everything is fine. And so they get the history completely wrong, and that allows people who have political campaigns to depower Maori in our society to then wage disinformation campaigns because they're trading on the fact the population is already misinformed in the first place, which makes it really ripe to put disinformation in there to further the misinformation that is part of our society. Awesome, thank you. So there's an interesting um, side discussion going on in the Slack about the nature of truth, which is really cool. Um, we've also had a question, which I think we will be covering later on, but I'll just um, read it out so that panelists have it in mind. How do you combat disinformation when there are increasingly rare common sources of information being transmitted in our society? Everyone is getting tailored content delivered into their hands 24 seven what are some approaches to figuring out what is common sense anymore which is a very awesome question so we'll just move on to our next uh, topic which is what's the relationship between mis slash disinformation to harm or extreme violence and also you know looking at online to offline consequences so um, again we will start with Tina You're on mute, Tina. Dang. We should do <laughs> mute bingo. Um, so in, in my own experience, what we saw happen here in, in our or here is that um, mis and disinformation was being shared online in relation to 1080. And, and I guess I should say one of the other issues here, one of the other impacts is that when misinformation and disinformation becomes rife, it means you have to build that into whatever project you work in. And so I work in a lot of environmental projects. We've had to build in a couple of years worth of community education to be able to get us to a space where we are safe to be able to discuss all of the pest control alternatives for our forest. So that has delayed the amount of time that we've been able to spend actually saving the species and it's resulted in significant species loss um, and but then also but we had to do it because without that and in the early stages what we had were people sharing information online and then other people would take that information and talk about it in the pub talk about it offline in other places and then other people who didn't even have social media accounts heard that and what they heard was, oh, these people want to poison you. Um, and and then they went and grabbed some guns and put the guns in the back seat of their truck and came looking for myself and my children. That's on top of the obvious stress and strain of the online um, threats, death threats as well. So all of those things have a have an offline impact, even when they're just online 
threats, they have real on, um, offline impacts. But on top of that, you know, these discussions don't just take place online. People talk about um, online things in all kinds of public places. And so those things, yeah, can, and in our case did, um, transfer over. And of course, as, as Emmy mentioned, there's the doxing that carries on. And um, particularly for communities like ours, there are um, people who just decide that it's more convenient for them to take issues into their own hands, which is what they've tried to do in the past. So, yeah, that's how it's tra translated over, <clears throat> excuse me, in our context anyway. Thanks, Tina. Uh, Emmy. Yeah, so I'm currently in the process of hopefully migrating to New Zealand, but currently I live in the United States and I live really close to the US-Mexico border in an area with a large amount of militias, some proportion, all of which are like white supremacists to a degree, but some proportion of which are actively like neo-Nazi terror cells. Um, and so we just like interact with groups like that uh, in different various public spaces. And I bring that up to say, obviously, the United States is right now kind of on the verge of some or arguably is already in a low intensity civil war with the possibility of a much more hot civil war uh, coming around the election. And this all like in a huge tangible way comes down to disinformation, like in Portland, there was a conspiracy going around that Antifa or the vague uh, notion of Antifa that um, a lot of conservative groups have um, were started these huge forest fires that swept through the entire Pacific Northwest. And as a result, militia started setting up checkpoints, armed checkpoints and interrogating people. They started actually chasing people around the forest with guns and stuff. And this is in a context where people are already being shot. And so, and everybody's armed on both sides. So I just say this to say, New Zealand kind of sees itself sometimes, I feel like some of these problems sneak up on the collective consciousness in New Zealand. Um, and uh, it's worth mentioning that like, it can happen in the US, it can happen in New Zealand. Uh, you already have um, Action Zealandia, which, which is a spinoff of Patriot Front from the United States engaging in your anti-lockdown with a bunch of people with QAnon signs. And now we have QAnon running for various political offices offices, and, you know, engaging in these highly dangerous, highly volatile uh, situations. This is to say nothing of like the epidemiology of, of COVID denial or something like that. This is just about civil conflict. So I'm, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but I just want to like state the reality of like mm -hmm. civil conflict and conspiracies. It's a thing. Thanks. So we're getting um, great comments in the chat, particularly David Hood. Um, he's been adding some interesting, um, a couple of links and things. And one of his comments is New Zealand, mainly because of size, has very strong outside of internet trust networks relative to the New Zealand internet. Internet That has been one of the defensive features in New Zealand that should be emphasised not to disconnect the internet from wider culture, which I thought was really... Um, great comment. Okay, David. Yeah, kia ora. I, I, I think that is a great comment. I'd also, though, endorse what Emmy's saying about the fact that we are not immune um, and that there are very real issues happening overseas um, that we can, we are subject to and should take um, serious notice of. This um, came home to me personally in the aftermath of the March 15 terror attacks in Christchurch, those those horrific attacks when, um, as many people watching this will know, um, my office was involved in dealing with the live stream video and the, um, the great replacement document associated with those attacks. Now, the thing that struck me in the aftermath of that work was um, some of the calls and messages we started receiving from members of the public essentially saying, hey, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have um, classified the live stream video as objectionable because I've been working through it in detail and, and I can establish that it's a fake. 
um, that this never happened. In fact, um, it's a digital recreation or the people involved were actors, which, which is a horrific proposition in um, anyone's right thinking um, language and approach. But, and yet we were getting these messages from people effectively echoing the false flag um, kind of conspiracy theorists that, uh, that I knew were active in the US following uh, mass shootings and horrific killings. Um, and I literally did not think that could happen here, but it can and it did. And as we've seen subsequently, um, all sorts of uh, issues have, have come, come to pass through disinformation. So we are subject to it. We need to pay attention to it. Awesome. Um, Sarah. Um, well, one of the things that I particularly wanted to bring up here is um, we, are, we are often discuss, discussing uh, misinformation uh, without actually understanding how it functions. Um, and one of the classical lines that we often talk about in tech circles is that if a service is free, it's yeah, it's the the service isn't the product, you're the product. And I wanted to put a slight qualification on that because it's not that you're the product, it's that manipulation of you or shift of you that is the product. Most, most um, uh, companies that own large amounts of data that results in the shifting of, of you and what you see um, are loath to give up that data. So it's more that they, um, they, they manipulate and shift you. Now, this doesn't necessarily need to be nefarious. Um, you can actually, recommendation engines that you see on YouTube and Netflix, et cetera, all this work this way. And amongst social policies, um, uh, circles um, uh, the, uh, amongst the expertise that we have bring, um, we refer to this as nudging. Um, it's it's been done for a long period of time. It's basically taking people that are already largely moving in a particular direction, and moving them by small increments. I mean, often we don't even know that we've been doing. Anyone that's seen a, a road cone placed slightly to shift you, um, the way in which you're walking in a particular direction for urban design, that's a form of nudging. You. It's like it just shifts you just slightly. Um, so it's often misinformation uh, is not about changing people's minds. It's about shifting a small percentage of the population in a particular direction. And so the thing is, when you only think, oh, it's only this amount of the population, but when you generalize that over a large proportion, that's how you the nudging is, is when it goes um you can move significant enough from people that it moves in that direction. And so um, this has been used in social policy work for a very long time. It's it's an instrument that we completely understand. Um, but I, I really want to, you guys to think about this, not in the context of an online problem versus an offline problem, and I'll talk about this later. Um, I want you to think about it in the terms of um, how does this function in terms of social behavior? Um, and so uh, just frame it in those kind of conceptions rather than an online versus offline tech problem. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. Um, we've got another question that we will be addressing in the next section, but I'll just read it out now so others have time to think about it. How do you combat mis- and disinformation when you don't have or have access to the correct information? So, um, M. So to build on what Sarah was saying there about nudging, one thing we need to be aware of when we're talking about disinformation or misinformation within a society is that even small effects can have large consequences. So it turns out that if you actually start looking at COVID-19 conspiracy theories in Aotearoa, there aren't actually that many of them. They're not particularly powerful, according to our surveys of social media and the like. They're kind of persistent baseline, which is annoying, but actually not a big vote changer. But... It only requires a few people to go, oh, that seems slightly plausible. I'm not going to wear a mask when I go to the supermarket. I'm not going to engage in social distancing when I'm waiting at the bank. I'm not going to wash my hands properly anymore. I'm going to go back to the just running them under cold water for five seconds and not even drying them. At that point, the person who is weakly believing some conspiracy theory about COVID-19 is a potential public health risk. So even small 
levels of belief in these things, even weak levels of belief in these things, if they're expressed by enough people, and enough people doesn't need to be a majority, this needs to be a significant minority, you are going to get problems amounting in your society. So it's good that we focus on the extreme harms, but sometimes you also need to think about the inadvertent harms that come from even weak belief in these kinds of beliefs. Awesome, thank you, Em. So just to let everyone know, we've just got one further topic for the panelists to cover, and then we will hopefully have about 10 minutes for um, question and answers, and, I, and I've been um, reading out the questions as they come in, so please feel free to add them either in the chat or in the Slack channel. So um, the final question we've got for the panel is what has been effective in combating misinformation or disinformation? What have you experienced or done that works? And again, we want to open this up to the audience as well to throw in your comments around what you have experienced that has worked for you so that people can um, learn from that and note that down as tools that they can use. Um, so we'll start again with you, Tina. Yeah, so within our communities um, here in Aotearoa and within Māori communities in general, I think we need to contextualise the issue and it's in a way that's relevant for your community. So for myself, for our community, we've been um, having discussions around how um, misinformation might impact upon our kotahitanga, our sense of community cohesion, um, and how important kotahitanga is when we need to come together um, to work in, in relation to COVID or in relation to many other issues. It might be looking after our coastlines, looking after our frost. A lot of those things require us to come together. Um, and so, you know, misinformation just really does cause community divisions. But I was really impressed to have seen that in, in two years, and it's taken us two years of concerted effort, um, that we went from a space of some a somewhat divided community on a number of issues because of misinformation to last weekend, we had communities shunning meetings that were being called by misinformation groups. Um, or the couple that did actually go to the meeting went there to call out the misinformation and said to them, you're actually telling lies and it's dividing the community and we don't agree with what it is that you're doing. So that was a level of community kind of response and unity um, in relation to misinformation that uh, I was really thankful for, but that was off the back of two years of work. So a lot of the things that, that I've seen work is, you know, uh, misinformation is largely online. Of course, it translates to offline impacts, but the forum, the platform for it is largely online. So for us, we looked at all of the other community spaces where we spread information, our kura, our marae, the marae meetings, our iwi radio station, all of the different places that we use to share information. And we started to look at how we can share, you know, good information or talk about misinformation in those spaces. And then I guess also having a talk about the, the rise in information and our, the change in our information scape. In the last 30 years, we've moved from a thousand terabytes of information moving around and being shared to billions of, of bytes of information, terabytes of information moving around and being shared. So we needed to have a relevant discussion for our community around how do we adapt and respond to the change in the information scape. Awesome. Thanks, Tina. Um, over to Emmy. Yeah, so I'm going to kind of uh, build on what Tina was saying. My theory of change from being a researcher in this field is, is that modern infodemics move in different ways than we're used to. Notably, they move in swarms uh, that are empowered, like super empowered by the internet and our interconnectivity there. And as a result of that, we need a lot more people working on the problem with their local expertise. And so the three things that I'm like either involved in or excited about are V Taiwan, which is this super sci-fi digital direct democracy thing that's going on in Taiwan, which of course is also an island, and they've been able to keep COVID 
completely at bay despite uh, persistent uh, propaganda attacks and all kinds of things through pub through these really brilliant public engagement uh, technologies that are accessible. Um, of course, Audrey Tang uh, running a lot of that. And then personally, I've built a lot of accessible tools for communities to sort of analyze uh, the spread of these types of things and make visualizations because it's easier for me to convince my friends than for the government to convince them, to be honest, um, because they trust me because we're friends, you know, we have a relationship and that works in different ways, especially with different communities who have different uh, language or communal ties or whatever the case may be. And so that's our SMAT social media analysis toolkit stuff. And then finally, I'm currently talking with a bunch of stakeholders in New Zealand, some research groups, some different community groups and uh, some different figures there. And we're all collaboratively working on a project that's sort of like a public, like community and academic interchange to like bring the most cutting edge tools and like research, but also be guided by the wisdom of communities um, and led by that type of useful uh, stuff, information. So that's those are the three things that I'm I'm most excited about and looking forward to uh, more support and hey, even project match. We have some funding. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Awesome, thank you. Moving over to David. Yeah, great. Look, um, this is a complex um, digital multifaceted problem. So there is no one solution at all. In fact, all you can have is a strategy combining um, interventions. But in terms of things that I've seen personally that um, that seem to work in this space, if uh, if you go to Scandinavia, if I, I went to the Swedish Media Council and they were showing me educational uh, modules that they were preparing for the uh, Swedish education system, training young kids um, and young people about what propaganda is and how they will be manipulated online and offline. Um, and I think we can take some of those principles and embed them into Aotearoa. It's a long-term strategy, but we need to start working on that and thinking along those lines because this issue isn't going away. The other thing is um, the actions of civil society, groups such as the Centre for Countering Digital Hate in the UK, who identify hatred super spreaders and unmask them effectively and uh, deplatform them off big uh, platforms such as Facebook and YouTube. Um, strong, um, good uh, reportage and media um, exposure of disinformation and toxic. Uh, disinformation such as the work by David Farrer um, in, in recent months um, looking into issues of this kind. Um, that all works and also I think we need to look at big tech and their responsibility in this area. They've deplatformed ISIS effectively. We know they can do incredible things in this space when they put their mind to it. They just need to be persuaded to do that. Awesome, thank you. So we're getting some really great um, links going up in the Slack. So one from um, Ross around Stanford's online reasoning course, um, and for, uh, something around MIT technology review, um, and a system that's being used in Taiwan. Um, so, and, and the Centre for Countering Digital Hate uh, link has gone up there. So that's, Awesome, and that was David Farrier rather than David Barra, so <laughs> <laughs> which is always um, easy to confuse. But there's right. information there. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to Sarah, Sarah, sorry. Um, well, one of the things that I want, I particularly wanted to bring up was this idea when we're talking about solutions and the way in which we may address address misinformation is we're often conflating and thinking about things at two different levels. We've really got the structural 
um, issues where you're dealing with this as a, at a societal level and then you're dealing with it often at the individual level, which are a different set of solutions entirely. When you're dealing with, um, it's like how do you talk to a family member that might be spreading this kind of information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one of the things, particularly because I'm a social scientist, I often deal with the structural away, arrangements of things. And one of the things that I often find is lacking in these kind of discussions, and this is building particularly off um, David's excellent points, what is that um, uh, as a social scientist, I hark back to the work of Jürgen Habermas, where he's dealing with the public sphere. And one of the major points amongst everything that goes on was that the public sphere exists as a space in which debate and tensions, et cetera, et cetera, occur in society. But the trouble is, um, his major point was that it needed to be separate from both um, uh, government and private sector. And so um, uh, what we've tended to do, uh, particularly over the last 10, uh, 20 years, is that we can't seem to forget that our online spaces are located very firmly in this private sector space. That doesn't necessarily mean it's inherently bad, but Habermas's point was that the the, the, the particular focus in this private sphere of um, uh, of the, the the tensions that occur there make it detrimental to what you actually need a public sphere to uh, operate as. And um, to pick up those points that David mentioned, we need government to start to um, create a space that where um, a public sphere can exist um, and not forget that we're trying to shoehorn solutions structurally into private sector spaces which don't operate the way in which a public sphere may be necessary to operate. And this picks up the points from Emmy, et cetera, um, that we're mentioning earlier. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. I um, just want to share a comment from Anthea um, on Slack. Sources of information and the credibility of it or perceived credibility is so important. For example, social networks versus broadcast TV versus radio. As a Māori person, I see my fellow Māori grasping to each other online and some of the misinformation they warm to. It's sometimes addressed and disproven on the likes of Māori TV um, and would love Tina's Bakaro or thoughts on this, which we will move to after um, we go to M if there was anything that you wanted to add on this section or if not we can go to questions. So I'll just make a kind of brief point moving from the public down to the personal. So as a conspiracy theory researcher, I have the benefit that I actually don't get much hate mail compared to other people who engage in studying conspiracy theories, because my work has largely been going, look, conspiracies occur. It's never irrational to suspect conspiracies are going on. You simply have to provide enough evidence to show that your particular conspiracy is the right one to believe in at this time. And part of the way that I interact with people online when they talk about conspiracy theories with me is trying to find common ground. And often the common ground is, look, governments do engage in conspiracies. You have a, a justified suspicion that conspiracies occur. Why do you think this conspiracy, though, is based upon the evidence? But finding common ground is difficult when it comes to certain topics. It might be easy on an abstract level to find common ground about political conspiracy theories, but when you start dealing with racist conspiracy theories, there is no middle ground you can go to. Okay, so, well, you know, maybe some Maori are lying about the treaty. Let's find common ground. In the case of no, when you're dealing with racist claims, you're dealing with claims where there is no common ground to be found. So in many respects, trying to work out how to negotiate those conversations is really difficult when trying to counter people who are misinformed versus people who are spreading disinformation. Awesome. Thank you. If I'm looking at the time correctly, we've probably only got about a minute left, so I must have miscalculated before, and I'm sorry about that. Emmy, I did want to go to you for a quick 30 seconds on notions of truth if you would like to address that. Yeah, so I feel like this is a, a little bit of a tricky topic, but I'll wrap it up really quickly. Obviously, there's a relationship between what is perceived as truth and power. Like if you're powerful, then you're able to spread something as a truth, regardless of how accurate it is. And so 
the intuitive knowledge of that that people have tends to make people distrust information from powerful people. But that has a negative impact when sometimes powerful people tell the truth. You know, if, if government says that the sky is actually green, I'm not going to like, you know, change my entire outlook. And so we have to have personal critical skills. And and so I think that that's a really difficult topic because there are still some kind of like material realities that we need to figure out. Like, you know, physics is important for making planes fly and we can build a consensus around that, even if there are subjective interpretations of what physics means or something like that. And so I think there's something to be said about building trusted centralization points of centralization. You know, some gov all all governments lie a little bit. Some governments lie more than others. And so what does it mean to be a trusted center of power? Awesome. Thank you. Um, I really wanted to give Tina time to answer that question, but I unfortunately I think we're going to be out of time so um, hopefully we can um, catch up with each other and on other um, social media or other mechanisms um, I just want to finish off by um, thanking all of our panel today you guys have been awesome we've had a whole lot of positive feedback on the Slack channel about the points that you've been making um, we know that this is such an important topic and that the conversation has to continue. So thank you all and thank you to our attendees and I'm going to stop here.